you are all so excited to be here. More than I thought you would be. Wow, okay, well, very good. Well, it is my pleasure to be here. I am Adam. Uh, you can find me on the interwebs. Oh, wait, hold on. No, you can't. Uh, but now you can. You can find me on the interwebs on the Twitterverse. Uh, please feel free to uh, post, write, at me, whatever. I don't post a lot of things that have a lot of real relevance or meaning to anyone but me. So if you're going to follow that thinking, you're going to get a lot of really smart, intelligent things from me after something like this talk, you won't. Um, but in the meantime, you can definitely find me there. That's a great place to go. Now, real quickly, I work for a company called Zeal. We're a web and mobile applications consultancy. But if you can kind of tell from the name, we're kind of a lot about the energy of things. And that's kind of what this talk is a little bit about. It's not just about positive energy or positive thinking. Really, it's about things like difficult conversations. And more specifically, what this talk is, is a practical guide on human psychology. And I'm highlighting the practical part here because more specifically, if it's not able to be put into practice, it's very, very hard to, to really create any meaning in your own life. Now, what I discovered was that um, clearly I'm a person that has a big and extroverted personality. Um, and that was, not, that was something that I found that was really fearful for some people. Uh, and that, that really was kind of like hurting like, <laughs> quite a bit to me because I realized like um, there were people that wanted to say something, wanted to talk to me. As an employer, I had members of our team that uh, didn't feel comfortable coming in and talking to me. And so I had to take this real kind of reflective stance back on things. And in doing so, I realized there were a lot of things I was doing that were not helping the situation. But similarly, there were simple things that they could have done to help me as well better understand what, what was going on for them. And so this talk, again, is about the human psychology after a bunch of research that I had done um, and practices that I had put in for myself as well as um, helped other members in my life, not just on our team, but in my own personal life, to help uh, us to communicate a little bit more so. But we're going to start here. And that is we're going to talk about state. Now, I'm not talking about the OO, uh, object-oriented side of state. We're not talking about programming here. I'm talking about things like state of mind. And specifically, the things that we do that empower us mostly start from here, and that is state, the state of mind that we are in moving forward. Now, this can be broken up into three different things, and we're going to start here with physiology. So here's what I want you to do, um, is I want you to take a moment, I want you to put yourself in a semi-neutral position in your chair, and I want you to close your eyes. And just breathe in and breathe out just simply and easily. Don't worry, nobody's judging you but me because I'm the only one who can see you. Exactly. But I want you to just breathe in and breathe out for a minute. Now what I want you to do is I want you to visualize with your eyes closed a time in which you had had to confront somebody or were confronted by somebody and you, had, you were put in a position that was very uncomfortable. I want you to just visualize that. And with every breath you take in, I want you to breathe that moment more and more into your body, physically into your body. And with every breath out, I want you to let go of the room and today in this very moment, I want you to just breathe that moment in for a moment. Think about what you're visualizing in your mind. And think and analyze your body, go toe to top of your head, and where does this come up? Do you feel it in your toes? Do you feel it in your knees, your gut, your heart, your head? Where do you feel it? Physiology can change everything. So go ahead and open up your eyes. Raise your hand if you identified a spot on your body in which you could feel the confrontation, the anxiety, or anything along those lines. It was easy, it was relatively palpable. Now raise your hand if you could not. Okay. So the next quality we're going to talk about real quick is language. And specifically, the language that we use and, and the story that we tell ourselves when it comes to this moment, right? So I want you to think back just to a handful of seconds ago, and I want you to think about what was the language you were using in that moment to yourself? What were you telling yourself? Were you saying that, oh, I'm weak, and whoever this individual is is going to beat me down? Or was it the opposite? I'm going to kick some ass. Right? What was the language that you were using? Because this is really important because the language we use ultimately defines the story that we tell. And the story that we tell ourselves ultimately creates the belief systems that we're going to have as we go into a given situation. 
Now, here's the beautiful thing is we can control all of this stuff because the last and final bit of state is focus. And the thing that we ultimately choose to focus ourselves on is the thing that will drive us and empower us forward to either be able to handle the situation, get out of a bad situation, or turn a situation around from something that isn't good and constructive to something that's productive and is, right? So again, it goes back to these three items. First is physiology, the second is uh, language, and the third is the things that we focus on. Now, all three of these things set our mental state, and in reality, in that order. I would be willing to bet you that more often than not, your physical state is the most radically affected by your physical change. We know this in terms of human psychology when it comes to, you know, if somebody is standing over you or the proximity to you, that physical difference has a lot in terms of state of mind. It can very easily affect those things. Now, also, we've learned over time, especially, well, let me ask, show of hands, how many of you felt bullied when you were a child under the age of 18? felt bullied. I'd be willing to bet that most of the time in that situation, because this is a predominant tactic or strategy, is physiology, physical difference. Oftentimes, we're bullied by individuals that are substantially larger than we are at the time. This is part of the reason, or one of the many reasons why this happens a lot in middle schools, because that's when growth spurts start to happen. And similarly, the things that, uh, the language that gets used in context at that time can either be really divisive and derogatory, and also for some individuals that might be going through change or emotional transition, that can be a really, really hard time for them, and the language that gets used can really affect that. So those two are really the predominant drivers that affect state. The third is the one that we often control the most, but it's a derivative of the first two. So if we're in a negative physical, uh, neg negative physical place, the language we're using is highly negative. Realistically, we're gonna focus on that, the negative. The next bit that goes into this was the ultimate driver and the ultimate like powerhouse was connection, right? Ultimately, when it comes to human communication, this is kind of the goal, is we wanna connect with the other individual. And this is the thing that was the most harmful to me personally in this situation, I was like, like, ultimately, what this is telling me is, like, I'm not able to connect with these people. And that's, like, really sad, because that's anything but what I want. I absolutely want to connect. And what I was losing sight of is that all the other things that were affecting their state, I was impacting. And that wasn't okay. That's what made this conversation with them very difficult. Now, if you were here last year, or if you've seen another talk of mine online, I talked a little bit about these, and that's the human needs. And these are the six human needs as defined by uh, America's guru, quote unquote, Tony Robbins. So I am entirely ripping this off. Um, but I found that this was really resonant because it put a lot of things into perspective for me. Going over these briefly, basically he quantifies that all things that we do in life are, every action that we take in life is to drive towards the fulfillment of the, these six basic human needs. The first top of the list here, certainty, uncertainty, significance, love and connection, are referred to as the basic needs. Certainty is things like, I want to know things are certain in my life. I want to know that the taxi cab is going to arrive and take me where I want to go, or I know that I want to get a paycheck, I know that the people around me care about me, things along those lines. Certainty. Uncertainty is the inverse of that, but it is also a need, right? If you're somebody that's ever skydived or done something that's really risky or exciting, maybe you, um, you know, added a dash F to the end of that git push and we're like, fuck it, I'm out. <laughs> you're like, I'm all in, y'all. You are clearly driven by uncertainty, right? Or if you're an individual that, that struggles a little bit with the managerial responsibility, right? And it might be something where significance is a major driver for you, that it makes you feel significant to be a person of authority in a situation, right? Or similarly, that you feel significant with uh, somebody that you love and appreciate, friends, family, spouse, someone along those lines. And the last is relatively obvious, but it's just the simple act of love and connection, which I said just a moment ago was something that was threatening to me and the most disruptive for me personally was a realizing, realization that I wasn't having that with the people I cared a lot about. Now, the fulfillment of the, the first basic human needs, these top four, generally, the way in which we fulfill those are, are via egocentric means. In other words, I, to, to fulfill the sense of certainty, uncertainty, significance, love, and connection, I will do things that are for me specifically. It's not about other people around me, it's about me, right? But then there's this bottom chunk, these last two, and these are referred to as the spiritual needs. It's growth and contribution. 
Now, here's what was found is most people, when you ask them, what are the two that drive you the most in your daily life? Not the ones that you want to drive you in your daily life, but the ones that probably do. Most people responded with one of two, certainty and significance. But when they were asked if I could be driven by any on this list, regardless of whether or not I do that today, which ones do I wish I was driven by, most of the time they say growth and contribution. Now here's the beautiful thing is, when you were driven by growth and contribution, realistically, you were probably more prone to serve others to get there, right? There's a lot of individuals in this room, and I'm actually very honored to know many of you that have contributed greatly to uh, changes in our entire ecosystem, as well as helping individuals enter into this ecosystem, either the, via code schools or ex, uh, extension programs, things along those lines. And I'd be willing to bet that most of the people that have founded those organizations and continue to drive them forward are, if nothing else, driven by the sense of contribution and that they want to do that. And realistically, they had a great sense of gro personal growth that occurred at that time. So, Remembering these two things, it's also really fundamentally essential that you remember that every single person in the room and every single person in our life is realistically working to fulfill these six. Every single one. Every single one. Even the craziest, asshole -ish of people are probably working towards the top four. Think of the real jerks in your life I'll bet you can pretty quickly pick which one is driving them. Now, look at the greatest people in your life and now identify which one are driving them. I'd be willing to bet assholes top, nice people bottom. That'd be my guess, right? Now, ultimately all this comes down, back down to his connection, so we're gonna talk about something that is very controversial to some people in this room, maybe none of you, but we'll find out, and that is mirror neurons. Now, mirror neurons is, it's, to a certain extent, is, it, is a, uh, it is not fully validated, but I find it very fascinating. And basically, a mirror neuron is a neuron that fires both when a person acts and when the person observing the act feels the same thing, okay? It is also referred to as the empathy neuron, right? So there was a study done uh, by neuroscientists, and there's a neuroscientist out of UCLA, his name was Marco Lacaboni, who has argued that mirror neuron systems in the human brain help us understand the actions and the intentions of other people. In the study, which was done in March 2005, he and his colleagues reported that mirror neur neurons could discern whether another person was picking up a cup of tea or planning to drink it based on these three fundamental principles. The first is context. Right? This is effectively, to, this whole thing to a large extent is effectively just pattern recognition, right? So the first is context, right? If you put it inside of a scenario, the top example is what it looks like before T is an example here. I'll, to, this is for Sam. And then the bottom example is what the situation looks like after T. If you look exclusively at the action that the individual is taking before they're interacting with everything else in the, around them, effectively very similar, but when you combine the two, ultimately what happens is we, draw, we derive intention, pattern recognition, right? Now here's what's interesting is, again, going back to mirror neurons is, to a large extent, this is the reason why this conclusion is drawn, is this is what helps us understand the world around us and act accordingly. And what has been found in situations like this is those that, uh, those that might be on, a, on the spectrum of autism often uh, have challenged combining these three together. And that's where some of that problem arises in terms of processing and so forth. But here's what I want to do. What I want you to do is, uh, if you have your laptop uh, open, if you could close it or turn it around, and here's what I want you to do is I want you to find a partner, and I want you to stand up. Stand up and find a partner, yep. Find a partner, stand up. All right, now here's what I want you to do. All right, partner, I want, one of you, I want one of you to be partner A and the other to be partner B. All right, excellent. Once you've determined A and B, put your hand up. Excellent. Okay, very good. So here's what I want you to do. Person A, I want you to listen very, very closely. Person A, raise your hand if you're person A. Excellent. Person A, listen very, very closely. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to maintain totally neutral, unemotional, unattached, like 
Nothing. You are blank slate. You are a white empty whiteboard. You are a nothing, nothing. You are a nothing. You got me, A? Say yes. Excellent. OK, person A. Now, person B, I want you to look deeply in the eyes of person A. I, person A, didn't you just commit to me that you were going to be nothing? Person A, did you not commit that, yes or no? Yes, you did. So you will do this, person A. I want you to be neutral, and I want you to look at person B. Look at person B, be neutral. Look at B. Person B, look at person B. OK. Now, person B, I want you to be neutral. Be neutral. Don't, no emotion, just be neutral. Person B, I want you to smile softly at person A. <laughs> smile softly at person A. Five more seconds. Just smile softly at person A. OK, you can stop your gaze. OK, so I want you to, now I want you to do is I want you to switch. OK, now here's the thing, person B, or person A, you've already been given the hint here. You are mentally ready for this. Am I right? Wrong? I'm right. OK, so I want you to do this again. So person A, you are going to become, wait, yes. <laughs> totally neutral, no emotion, hold true. Person B, I was wrong the first time, and right, yes. Person B, totally neutral, no emotion, <laughs> plain slate. Okay, you've already been ready, you're already prepared. You've got nothing being thrown at you, okay? Now person A, look at person B in the eyes and smile gently. You got five more seconds. All right, very good, very good. OK, give yourself a hand. OK, so I want you to be very honest with me. This is not a competition, but I want you to be very honest with me. I want you to raise your hand if you were a person that was able to maintain a totally straight face, no emotion. Totally straight face. OK, now look around the room. So we're looking at, like, what? A percent of you, maybe, right? What's wrong with the rest of you? Right, yeah. Those are the sociopaths. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. No. The point of this is, the point of this is that the reality is, is that when we are put in a position where we are to witness the things happening around us. This is really, so my background is in theater. We're in the right place for that. Um, and this, there's a strong argument that live presentation, whether it's live music, live theater, live performance of any kind, live, 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 is more fulfilling psychologically in ways that we might not be able to acknowledge right away because of an example such as this, which is mirror neurons. This is a very simple and rudimentary example of that. When we witness things, our bodies react. Now, of those of you that weren't able, were not able to hold it, hold it straight-faced, how many of you got joy or pleasure or positive emotions out of it? Right? This is very, very, very important when it comes to the interactions and the ways we connect with other people. When we do simple, simple things, like illustrate to them the type of relationship and emotion and connection I want to have with them, the probability is, is that they will feel that, right? Managers in the room, remember this when you're going into meetings with your team. The way you set the stage when it comes to just something this simple can radically affect the psychological output of that entire experience for the other person involved. Huge, almost immeasurable. Now, one more example we're going to do, and it's OK. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, I, can, can you laugh uncontrollably for me? That works. <laughs> Why are you clapping? Because there's crazy people in this community. 
right? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so this is the thing is that, again, another example of that. Think of all the, the really cute baby videos that are out there, just little kids laughing that we watch on YouTube. Why does that matter to us? It's because of this same reason. Keep this in mind. Remember this, that empathy is the currency of connection. The more we empathize, the more connection we have. So remember that. Empathy is the currency of connection. Okay, so let's get actionable here, and let's talk a little bit about navigation, in terms of how we navigate through this stuff, like things like difficult conversations in our life, or difficult situations one way or another. To remember this, that my feelings are based on my perceptions, right? My feelings are based on my perceptions. There's a term in neurological or uh, neurolinguistic programming. I was going to use the NLP, but that means something different to our group. Um, but neurolinguistic programming, that is the, it's the concept of anchoring. Now, <clears throat> how many of you have a negative association to just this image? Right? It's just an image. How many of you have the exact same alarm clock? Right? <laughs> it's like, that's my alarm clock, dude. <laughs> Where's my, where's my credit? I oh, know, totally. Um, this is true, is that the, there is, oftentimes what happens for us is we have anchors. If you look at all of the negative experiences that you've had with interacting with other people, I would be willing to say, I would be venturing a bet that realistically, those, those interactions that you've had are, are making it harder for you to enter very similar situations. There's an example that's given when it comes to those at a funeral, and the simple example is this, that one of the things to be mindful of is when people are in a really strong emotional state, right, um, especially something that's highly negative, physical touch, remember physiology affects state, and that physical anchor can lock itself in to where li quite literally, when I touch that same spot, it can trigger subconsciously emotions to be discharged for that individual. And as an example, if I was to go up to somebody who had a grieving, uh, who was grieving the loss of their father, and I was to walk up and say, I'm so sorry for your loss, and touch him on the shoulder. Next person walks up, walks up and says, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss, and touches him on the shoulder. Five other people do that. Do you have any idea what could possibly happen if that happens again? Right? Now, here's the challenge with this, and I realize that this is the other side of the difficult side of conversations that exist, is... You may, ver you may have no idea what anchors exist for another person. In fact, it's highly probable that you'll have absolutely no clue and that they might not even know. But you have to know that that is very likely for them. So the only way to really dive in and understand what the balance of that looks like and what all those components are is to understand the story. Because ultimately, while my feelings are based on my perception, my feelings can be negotiated. They can change. I can change the way I see and feel things, especially around the things that I am most connected to. So preparation for conversations like this and situations like this is really essential for both individuals that are involved, right? It's really essential for a lot of reasons, but mostly for those three reasons I was giving before, physiology, language, and focus. If you're not in the right mental state and you walk into a situation and you're focusing on the wrong thing, then your preparation and that conversation may very well go the wrong direction, or at least not be as predictable and as certain that you might want it to be. Now, if you're one of those uncertainty people, you just walk blindly into things and you're like, Bleh! and that's what you do, and that's perfectly fine too. But the first thing I'm gonna go over is breathe. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a second, I want you to put yourself in a, sit in a neutral position again. I'm gonna teach you a very simple breathing exercise that you can do at any point in time, anywhere in your day, and it will literally only take you less, it will literally take you less than a minute. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to just sit there for a moment. If you need to put your hands on your legs, that's fine too, but just be as neutral as you can. I want you to breathe in on a count of five. I want you to do your best to hold it for a count of 20. Do your best and then let it out on a count of 10. Just do your best, okay? Count of five, ready? One, two, three, four, five. Count of 20, hold it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Let it out on 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You do an exercise like that five times, you will change your physiology. 
right? So it's really essential that you get into this mind, this headspace before as you're preparing for this so you can stay in the right state of physiology and ultimately move to the right state of focus that you need. But breathe is number one. The next is map your assumptions. So oftentimes in conversations or in situations, we make a lot of assumptions about the other person's interpretation of what we did via our own interpretations. So just like navigating a map, it's imperative that you understand and map the assumptions that you're making about a given situation. I don't have the opportunity to go into too much detail about this, but if you have questions about this one, I can go into it a little further. But basically what you're looking for is what are the things that are not driven by fact, right? What are the things that you heard, feel, kind of thought happened? Like, what are those assumptions? If you're drawing the conclusion about another individual that draws you to the belief that, oh, they don't love you, they don't care about you, they don't value you, more often than not, it's, it's based on just assumptions we're making, and most of the time, from what I can tell, it's based off of previous experience that's drawing us to that conclusion. So it's really, really essential that we map our assumptions first. The next is to map your fears. What are you afraid of if this conversation goes awry, right? What happens if this doesn't work out, right? Um, same thing to mapping your assumptions, you wanna do the same thing with this. And I literally will create a list. So I keep an index card on me most of the time. Uh, let's see if it's on my pocket, except right now. Yeah, there it is, okay. So this is for this talk, right? And it's very important for me that I write down specifically, like, what is my goal? Like, what is my outcome that I have for this talk? Like, if, if nothing else, what am I gonna land on? And what are the other things that I wanna avoid mentally, right? And it's really easy, it's just an index card. I mean, I could probably make an app for that. Again, we're in the right community, but it's an index card and a pen, and I can do this just about anywhere. The next is, what do you want to learn or understand about the other individual? This is also very important. Going into a conversation where you're seeking to learn automatically moves you from the top four basic needs into the bottom two of growth and contribution. Instantly, just like that. If I'm looking for a reason to connect with you because I wanna learn something about you, even if you're the most detestable individual I can imagine and fathom, it immediately puts us, it, it puts us in a space where we can be really constructive and productive. But remember this, understanding does not mean acceptance. Just because you understand where they're coming from doesn't mean you agree with it, okay? So remember that. Um, and this can be very helpful, again, when you're in a situation where, you know, things are tough. And you, there's a lot of people in this world that I can't imagine sitting down with because there's nothing about what they think that I agree with. But if I go into it trying to learn something, then at least it can start to be constructive. And then the last is what I said, told I wrote down on this card, which is know your outcome. What's your outcome in the conversation? Even if somebody's coming to you, what is your outcome? For me, my outcome most often, not especially right now, is to connect and learn. I just wanna learn. Um, what? I don't know yet. Well, I don't know what this is gonna be about, but that's okay. So I'll just connect and learn. Now, you've done all the preparation, it's now go time. So we're gonna breathe again. Make sure you breathe. If you're going into a situation like a, maybe a salary negotiation, or in my case, we work with a lot of clients where they've got budgets or they're gonna try and talk us down on numbers, that's my story, right? These are the types of things that I need to make sure that I've got my, my head uh, and my state in the right place. The next is to make it safe. This is really important as well. And as somebody that um, is, wants to meet somebody where they're at, I will try and be the one that puts myself into their situation, their physical situation. Um, if it's their office, their location, I will call them. I'll put myself in a place where I'm mentally ready to have a conversation with them, but I'm gonna make it safe for them. And similarly is to ask them or to, to try and pick up what makes them feel safe. And if at any point in time, you feel like you're not achieving that or there's something that's not going, that's going awry, it is perfectly acceptable to acknowledge that and perfectly acceptable to reschedule in life. That's okay too. Then the third is to explore the story. And this is oftentimes in a situation where there's confrontation or conflict. It's, it's very important to remember that belief systems are, are a derivative of old experiences most of the time. And if you start to explore the story, how somebody's understanding an action or a thing that's happening around them, then it's easier to empathize with them. Um, again, just because you understand it doesn't mean, doesn't mean you agree with it or accept it. But what it can mean is that you can understand it and help, help identify how you can work and grow together. 
Also very important is to acknowledge their contribution and acknowledge their feeling, whether you agree with it or not. By simply acknowledging it, it just helps level the playing field. It's like, you're human, I'm human, we're just, we can find a way to work through this, and I recognize that what you feel is what you feel, regardless of whether or not I agree with how you got there, that's, that's irrelevant. What's relevant is that you feel that way. And similarly is to recognize the contribution that somebody, that I have made to this positively or negatively, and to allow them the opportunity to do it, not necessarily do it for them, okay? So I can say, I feel like I've contributed to this because I just didn't give you the chance to speak your mind at the time. I feel like I must have cut you off or just kept this from being con constructive and I just want you to know that. Like I'm acknowledging that that could have been a major player in this. Then inquire to learn, ask questions. Do as much as you can to learn what you can from the situation that you're in. And then ask open questions and here's some examples. So instead of, uh, you're full of shit, I could say something like, can you help me understand better your perspective? <laughs> right? Can you say a little more about how you see things? Uh, what information might you have that I don't have? That is really helpful, and that's something I realize a lot, is like, I'm privy to, in our company, I'm privy to information that I forget other people don't have. So when they get frustrated and they get all this anxiety, it's so easy for me to overlook the fact that they don't know what I know. And so they have nothing but uncertainty going on in their life. Well, it's an easy question to ask. Like, what information do you think I have that you don't have that could help you, right? Um, what impact have my actions had on you? How do you see it differently? Again, not that I have to agree with it, but just I want to know. I want to explore the story. Last two things, and then we're good to go. So confrontation. In the event that you experience confrontation with another individual, and, the, and uh, it happens a lot. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced a confrontation with somebody. Keep your hand up if it's been physical. Yeah, totally. It happens to a lot of us, more, more than the psychopaths in the room. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> right? it's, this is true, that confrontation is really, it's, it's, it's a very powerful thing that most of us ex have experienced in our life. So I'll give you a couple of real quick things. Number one is physiology, language, and focus. If you can change those three things, then oftentimes the confrontation will disperse. A simple one is in the event that like anytime we're having an argument, so anytime my spouse and I get into a case where we're just like, we're button heads pretty hard, the very first thing we'll do is change location. Very first thing. Just physically move, right? That will more often than not at least bring the, diffuse it down to half or some arbitrary percentage. Just, just help move that along. Language we sort of talked about, but oftentimes when I start to ask the question to help understand them a little bit better, that gets their language identified, uh, that helps them identify what language they're using and helps me understand as well. And I can start to mirror the language so that we can, again, have this sense of common ground. A lot of this stuff are, are the things that we just experience. Again, this mirroring model. And then the last is focus. So we've experienced this with family members that struggle with depression or struggle with anxiety. And again, most of the time, it's, it's what they're focusing on creates this downward spiral from them. Yes, there's many other factors as well, but that is also one that can be very helpful to kind of address and change. So if you can help change their focus onto something different, and I don't mean make a joke or something along those lines. I mean just help them see another way as an example um, we work, uh, we do a lot of hiring, as do many of the companies that you work for, and I find it's very common for individuals to come into an interview and they're focusing on their lack of experience, right? And my favorite question is ask is, yes, but what are you the most experienced at? And everybody's got an answer. Everybody does, right? And it, it's just a change of what, what it is that they bring value to in just about any situation they're in, right? So it can be just as simple as helping them change their focus. And similarly, language, right? The very last thing is problem solving. So the goal in all of this is to get to a solution to the problem. And similarly, it starts with the breath. It starts with understanding. And it ends with getting to a point of clarity, right? Once we can communicate, we can identify what a good healthy problem would look like, or I'm sorry, a good healthy solution would look like for the problem that we're talking about. So identifying this, uh, so a couple of small things is identify a standard of fairness, right? 
Um, this can be really easy because I believe that for the most part, most people, there's definitely outliers, but for most people, we want something that is fair. Sometimes we can't articulate that, nor do we want to consciously admit it, but it is something that we want. We do want some, something that's fair. And similarly, unfortunately, compromise to a lot of people has become something that's, that's a negative anchor, that it doesn't mean something good. So we won't say that, we'll say fairness. Like, what is fair? And if you can define what the standard of fairness looks like, then now you can strive to solve a problem that is within those boundaries. And it's kind of hard to say that, well, we discuss, I mean, we've discussed what's fair, we've set that tone for what becomes fair. Now, once we meet that, isn't that good? And if we can be good with that, then it can resolve. Sometimes this happens over many, many sessions. Sometimes it happens inside of a minute. It, time is irrelevant to this, but when that becomes the goal of finding something that's fair and reasonable for everybody that's involved, pretty easy to get there. So this is difficult conversations. I know that you've all experienced it. I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody else if you have questions about it, um, some tools or a situation that you're in that you'd like some maybe thought, or um, I would love to learn more about your story, okay? My name is Adam Cuppy. I'm from Zeal. You can email me if you need to. It has been my pleasure. Thank you all so much. <laughs>